So hello, everybody. Welcome to our final brown bag of Utah's Archaeology and Historic Preservation Month. Uh, usually the hosting duties are, are by Elizabeth Hora, our public archaeologist, but I'm covering today. I'm Chris Merritt, uh, your, your State Historic Preservation Officer. And I'm excited to welcome today Anya Kitterman uh, from Hill Air Force Base and Maya London from the Utah National Guard uh, to our series of talks about the archaeology and historic built environment of Utah's military installations. I'm going to let them actually introduce themselves and what they do and their roles. Uh, but first, I wanted to handle some quick instructions. So this is a Zoom meeting, not a webinar. So your camera and microphone may be turned on at your discretion. However, we do encourage you uh, to keep your microphone muted during the presentation to improve the audio uh, quality of this recording. Uh, we are also putting this on Facebook Live. So uh, you can also, if you're not really ready to have your face projected for all eternity onto Facebook Live or our recording on YouTube eventually, you want to turn your camera off. Uh, and then if you're comfortable leaving your camera on, please do that. I am going to ask everybody to keep questions to the very end, but if you want to throw questions while the presenters are talking into the chat button, uh, that would be fine with me. We will then circle around at the end of the session to handle all your questions. I'll probably do the chat questions first, but if someone has a more in-depth question and you want to unmute yourself to do that, uh, we'll have time at the end of this presentation for that. So I'm going to admit the last few folks into this meeting, and I appreciate you spending your lunch hour with us, and I shall pitch it over to Anya Kitterman. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Happy lunch um, for those who are enjoying while you watch this. Um, as Chris mentioned, I'm Anya Kitterman. I'm the Cultural Resource Manager at Hill Air Force Base and the Utah Test and Training Range um, in Utah. And I get the distinct pleasure of managing a variety of different resources um, from the prehistoric period up through um, very current kind of almost modern um, things. So we'll be talking a little bit about that. But again, thank you for all joining us and I hope you enjoy this. And I'm gonna send it over to Maya who is, will introduce herself. <laughs> Hello everybody, my name is Maya London and I am the Cultural Resource Manager for the Utah National Guard. Um, we will talk about all the resources that we manage here just in a minute, but um, we cover land all throughout Utah, so we have quite the variety that we'll look at today. Um, and I think I will kick it back to Anya to get us started. Take it away, Anya. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, I think we can go on to that. Um, so the first thing we wanted to do was kind of talk about the types of resources we have, which is, uh, as you can see at the bottom, archaeology buildings and landscapes. Oh my, we have quite a bit of different things that we do like, or that we um, are in charge of managing and preserving. So if we go to the next slide, we're going to go ahead and start off with Hill Air Force Base. Um, and Hill has um, numerous cultural resources that it protects and manages. It stems from archaeological sites. Um, including a historic railroad, um, which is actually about 63 miles um, of historic railroad were on the installation itself. We have a small homestead and we have a canal, but we also have numerous buildings that date from the 1920s. Um, again, through the Cold War is really where our historic buildings date through currently. Um, and we're always assessing and adding new ones to that list. And so, these um, structures or fe features are often associated with larger archeological sites. So if where it is for me that in the bottom left picture, you'll see a big giant blue crane. That's actually a crane that used to um, transport Minutemen missiles from large trucks to rail and back uh, to rail cars and back and forth. Um, so it's not really being, our rail isn't used anymore, but it's not being used anymore, but it, that is part of the um, historic rail archaeological site. So we get a lot of unique things um, here on Hill. Um, and the rail is especially is one of our most unique sites on Hill Air Force Base because it's was really what brought the um, installation to where, it, the location where it is. It was just south of Ogden, which was a major rail hub at the time. Um, there was not much else around the base at that point in time. It's on a sandy hill. And so it was a perfect place um, 
to store a lot of munitions. And that was just after World War I. And so the rail was a critical part of the base for most of its existence um, up until the 60s or 70s when um, the, the public or the trucking transport really started taking over. And so that's kind of some of the major resources we manage um, on hill. Again, archeologically, we don't have a lot of prehistory left on the installation itself because the base has been here so long and utilized so much of the land but we do have a lot of those historic um, resources still um, present on the installation itself. And so next we'll go ahead and go on to the Utah Test and Training Range um, and talk about some of our unique resources there. Uh, we, we manage about a million acres of land out on the Utah Test and Training Range. And that's out in the West Desert. So for those of you here in Utah, whenever you hear the jets heading out West, that's where they're headed to do their training. Um, and these resources include the earliest remnants of man um, on the range that date to approximately 12,000 years ago through Cold War era historic targets. So we have quite a wide history um, that we're managing on the range. Um, we include, we also do have historic buildings such as the picture in the upper right, which is a rocket motor testing facility um, that dates to the Cold War. And one of the really unique and wonderful things about um, the military ranges specifically is because we've used them for so long for testing and they've had with that use comes a fence line. Um, most people don't want to cross over a lot of warning signs, all those types of things. These resources are protected in ways that they wouldn't be um, if they were more open to the public. And so we've been able to find very unique resources out on that range. Um, and if you look down at the bottom right, there's a picture and one of the resources we found recently within the last um, five or so years was a uh, open pit. And in fact, the earliest open pit um, fire site that has been found in the Great Basin. Um, it dates to, again, a little over 12,000 years ago, and it included everything from um, just the fact that there was a hearth site there, but it also included um, a huge amount of bird bone, different types of fowl, um, as well as tobacco seeds. And so we're still, um, do, there's still some work being done on that, um, but there, there's also some papers and some things that have come out concerning that because it's such a unique site. Um, we are also in the same region this was found. If you look at that lovely point there in the center, um, which is a hasket point, that's in fact the largest hasket point ever found. Um, and we found a modified version of a hasket, a modified hasket found nearby this hearth pit. And so it was, it was, gave us an opportunity um, and our researchers an opportunity um, to get a date on these hasket points and really get a firm date on that because we had one found at the same level um, as, as the um, hearth site was found. And, and that area has been, it is very unique in that we found so many of these hasket points in one 5,000 um, acre survey alone, we found over, or I, I say we are wonderful contractors, <laughs> um, found over 50 of these hasket points. Um, alone. And so we've got a really unique landscape out there called the Old River Bed Delta. And that's where a lot of these are being found. And the, the Delta was formed um, as Lake Bonneville was receding and it became a big marshland. And we still have remnants of these channels um, from the Delta and such out there. And it's along there that we're finding some of this really interesting, really unique um, archaeological sites. And so that's one of the things that we're still really exploring and um, getting a better handle of, of exactly how much and what is out there. And in fact, we are hoping to do some data recovery on another um, fire pit site that we've recently, uh, that was found just a couple of years after the site that was excavated that's shown here. And so um, we, we th this is, that's one area, but we also house different types of, um, prehistoric sites such as the rock rings. We have a whole hillside of these rock rings up there. We do have um, some rock art out there as well as um, a lot of cave and rock shelter sites that are considered um, significant and some sacred to the um, local tribes. So that's kind of a 
brief overview of a lot of the resources that we do protect, manage, and really um, oversee out on the Utah Test and Training Range. So I'll pass it to Maya to talk about some of the Utah National Guard sites. Yeah, so the Utah National Guard, um, we manage archeological and historic structures throughout the state of Utah. Um, we have armories and training areas from Vernal to St. George and everywhere in between. So we get a little bit of everything in terms of Utah archeology span and historic buildings. Um, these sites range from those representing the rich Native American past, as well as early pioneer settlement and agriculture sites to the more contemporary sites related to the history of the Army and the Utah National Guard. So in terms of our historic buildings, um, we manage over 90 structures and features that are over 50 years old. And just to kind of give you an idea of what those are, um, we manage two buildings at Fort Douglas. Um, they were both constructed in the late 1800s as part of that historic district. And those buildings house the Fort Douglas Military Museum that is operated by the Utah National Guard. We also op um, manage two buildings out at the Wendover Historic District at the airport. Um, in addition to several of our armories across the state are historic. And those are used by National Guard units every day for their offices and for training. Um, most of our buildings are located at Camp Williams. You can see a couple of those here. Um, we have historic and modern buildings at camp. So for example, on the bottom right hand picture is a photo of our 1928 recreation hall that was recently renovated. Um, we have a 1930s masonry irrigation ditch that runs through camp. You can see the photo here on the bottom left. That was used to um, water a lot of the trees that were planted at camp when it was first established and those trees are still there today or when it was first uh, permanently established I should say. We also have a 1927 era parade field that overlooks the Jordan River and the Traverse Mountain Range and it is a gorgeous view of Utah Valley. But the jewel of our historic buildings is the Officers Club and that is the top uh, picture on your slide here. So the Officers Club is located at Camp Williams. Um, for those that don't know, Camp Williams is located in Bluffdale, Utah, kind of by the um, Traverse Mountain Range area. So the Hostess, or the Officers Club was originally called the Hostess House, and it was built for the wives, girlfriends, and mothers of soldiers that were in the National Guard at the time. So this building is listed on the National Register, and it is very frequently used today for weddings and parties and meetings. It really is um, our pride and joy in terms of our historic buildings for the National Guard. So in terms of our um, prehistoric and historic archaeology sites, we have a plethora of all these different kinds of sites. Um, they're located, like I said, we have training areas and readiness centers across the state that house these resources, but the majority of them are located at um, Camp Williams, which is roughly a 24,000 acre training area and developed um, cantonment area. Um, the training area houses a wide range of these archaeological sites from the archaic period to Fremont to early historic homesteads. Um, Camp Williams is also home to several lithic sources, which coupled with its close proximity to the Jordan River and Utah Lake, make it a prime landscape for use throughout the past and continuing with the UTN or with the Utah National Guard's management of the land and its resources today. So you can see a couple of the photos here. Um, the top left, the, a portion of the Provo Reservoir Canal runs along the east side of Camp Williams. Um, just above the Jordan River. We also have some examples of uh, projectile points and Fremont pottery that have been found at camp. And the bottom right-hand photo is a foundation from the Hardman Homestead uh, that is located at Camp Williams. So we have a little bit of everything, um, but it's not just archeology span and historic buildings. We also have paleontology resources. Uh, we have a petrified wood trunk that was recently, well, a couple of years ago, found at camp. So we're working to manage, you know, resources from all these different time periods, all these different eras, and preserve them while also balancing, you know, or balancing preservation and um, the training needs of the Utah National Guard. 
And I will kick it back to Anya for this section. Let me unmute myself. So those are the resources <laughs> we manage. Um, but we also wanted to talk a little bit about, about how we really work to be proactive in our preservation and really try to understand those resources um, and resource needs that are often expanding on a regular basis. And so if Maya can go to the next slide. Um, so I've just included a couple of the upcoming projects that were, well, really their current projects that were um, getting going and starting on right now um, and delving into. So we've had um, a lot of interest expressed by our tribes. He'll um, consults with 21 different tribes from um, eight different states that have an uh, ancestral tie to the land. And so we really try to um, hear, hear those types of things that they're interested in finding out about and what, what we can do um, as a program to pot potentially move those things forward. So one of those that came in with one of our, with throughout many of our discussions was doing an ethnobotanical study. Um, so we've been, this is one we've been trying to put together for a few years where we were finally able to get um, some funding for. And what we're looking for here is really to see, especially on our Utah test and training range, really see what type of resources, um, floral resources specifically, anything that's tied to plants that we might have on the range of the tribes um, may be interesting in using for subsistence, for ceremonial, um, you know, do we have areas where the traditional gathering might occur? And it's not something that's really been looked at um, in depth, but it's something the tribes are very interested in. And so a lot of the range, um, unfortunately, has been taken over by cheatgrass, um, um, our, our frustration to our natural resource manager, who's actively working on restoration. And so the hope with that is those areas that have been preserved, um, that are native, can continue to be preserved, but also that we can work closely with that natural resource program. And if we find specific plants, specific needs that the tribes have, are we able to start including those um, in our restoration effort and really focus on some of those types of, um, of plant species? And so um, the starting point is first identifying what we have and what the tribes are interested in. And so that's what the this ethnobotanical study will do. And it's gonna be working really closely with both our natural resource program, but also of course, those, those 21 tribes who are interested in participating and providing some input on, on what they might be interested in. So that's a really exciting project that will be starting hopefully this summer. Um, and the, the other one that is currently ongoing, um, we started last fall, is our historic target study. As I mentioned earlier, the, the range has been used um, and it first started out as part of Wendover um, and the, the, era, the base out there. And so it's been used um, from very early on in, in training with any sort of planes and been behind the fence since, since the World War II. And so we have a large amount of those, um, the, those targets still in place, those historic targets still in place, some of which are still being actively used, um, but some of which are not. And so we're trying to get a handle on exactly how many of those historic targets are still out there, what that landscape looks like, and then how we as an installation can manage and preserve those features still um, in, that are, that are still in place out there. The tricky bit about that is most of the historic targets, if you're on the ground, they're very ephemeral. You can't see them very well just walking over them. They're, they're very shallow in some places. Um, and so a lot of the work for this one, for this project is actually being done through using um, historic photos, historic aerial photos in particular, um, historic maps, whatever documentation we have, but we're also bringing in LIDAR, um, at least on our North Range, and using LIDAR to help us really track and look at these resources and be able to assess them properly for their eligibility, um, as well as get a better understanding of what that early um, target area looks like. And so that's been one of our really interesting projects that we're moving forward on right now. So these are the kinds of things we like to do to kind of be proactive, not just wait for something that could impact cultural resources to um, understand our resources, but really be proactive and try and understand those resources so we can 
um, as an installation be able to avoid and minimize any impact to these resources that are already out there. So that's what I had. So I'll pass it back to Maya. So for our archaeology and historic buildings, I kind of broke it up a little bit here. Um, the thing with National Guard lands, um, they cover at Camp Williams approximately 24,000 acres. And a majority of those lands have been inventoried for cultural resources. So that makes it easier for us to conduct regular monitoring and resurvey of these areas, um, revisit sites that we know about, um, identify sites that haven't been documented yet to make sure they aren't being impacted by training or anything like that. Um, but similar with Hill Air Force Base, these areas are fenced off. They're not open to the public. So we do have this chance to preserve them and protect them that they normally wouldn't have if they were on public lands. We also provide a yearly training for soldiers at Camp Williams so they are aware that yes, there are cultural resources out here. Um, and when you're training, you know, be cognizant of that and don't go in areas that you're not supposed to. Um, just so they're aware of it. And if they, you know, see anything, they can let us know. With our buildings, we currently use quite a few of our historic buildings at camp. Um, for example, my office is in a um, officer's latrine that was converted to offices. So we're using these buildings every day. Um, we perform regular maintenance on them so we can keep using them into the future. Sometimes it requires, you know, more than paint to get these buildings or to keep these buildings usable. So, you know, we'll do a larger scale renovation, like replacing the electrical or the plumbing, while still making sure that we are retaining these features that make uh, the buildings eligible for the National Register. So, for example, the recreation hall that we saw a couple minutes ago, kind of the orangey red building, um, that went under renovation a couple years ago. You know, we replaced the siding, but made sure it was the same style of the original place the windows again, making sure they were the same style. So it kept its eligibility, but we refreshed it and made it so we can keep using it for meetings and things like that. Um, you can see here on the right hand side is a more up close photo of the officers club. This is a gorgeous building. All of the rock was mined from Camp Williams. It is, you know, fully stone walls, very thick. It's a gorgeous building, but it does need to have some updates done. So this fall, we will be performing a renovation with our construction management office to put on a new roof, update the electrical and the plumbing, um, you know, kind of clean up some of the floors. A couple of the rooms do have original floors that are underneath carpets. So we will get that carpet out there, make their original floors look gorgeous. Um, and we work really closely with the State Historic Preservation Office and the contractor to make sure that we are updating things that will keep the building useful for a very long time while also keeping all of these features that make the building eligible and also gorgeous. I mean, where else can you find a gorgeous rock building like this? So we really try to balance with archaeology and our historic buildings. Like I said, balance continued use and historic preservation. So another thing that Annie and I wanted to talk about is how much uh, we collaborate, especially our archaeology offices. Um, there's four different DOD, so Department of Defense agencies throughout Utah. There's Hill Air Force Base, Utah National Guard, Dugway Proving Ground, and Tooele Army Depot. And one thing that we frequently um, get together for is our tribal consultation programs. Um, individually, we send out letters each year and consult on different projects with tribes throughout the West, but we also host an annual American Indian meeting once a year where um, leadership from tribal governments and leadership from military side can come together and meet in person. We could talk about different projects we're doing, whether it's training oriented or natural resource oriented. We can just have conversations and talk to each other and reinforce those relationships or build new relationships to make sure that we are getting those um, tribal perspectives integrated with our management plans and with our trainings. Um, 
This year, we couldn't host our meeting in person, so we went virtual. And that was really helpful because even, you know, if tribes that are farther away, if they can't come, um, we can still get their perspectives and get their opinions. So I think we're going to continue that into the future of having in-person meetings and um, doing these virtual meetings to really get everybody together and connected. Um, go ahead, Anya, with public outreach. Yeah, so one of the other ways we really coordinate on is doing public outreach. Um, neither of us have massive staffs, uh, a lot of people to be doing things. And so we found that by working together um, and Maya and the Utah National Guard and Hill have really, really kind of taken this to the next level. We're really trying to do a lot more. We found that we can more effectively and more efficiently reach and take these resources out to folks because that's again part of our mission is also to share these resources um, and, and not just have them behind the fence and so we've been able to coordinate a lot on um, these the doing the public outreach with events just like this one um, but we've also been able to work with the division of indian affairs we've worked with the state history office um, and various different like school and stem organizations to to do that and being able to tag team this and not kind of feel like you have to take the burden on yourself has made this a much more feasible um, and a much easier option for all of us and so I think that's one really good way that we've been able to form a really good partnership in, in being able to manage not just manage our resources but also bring those resources to the people and, and to the public so that's been a great coordination effort. So, so again, that kind of tying right back into this. So how are we doing that? How are we bringing these resources out? Um, and if you're interested, how can you guys see more of these resources um, and get a chance to see some, uh, get a chance to experience some of them? And so if you can go to the next slide. So I've just incorporated, um, and we'll talk about several of the ways we've done that. But the first and foremost, we wouldn't be able to do this without um, amazing partners and a lot of folks who are helping us out um, in being able to bring these resources out. So I've got that list there on the slide. These are a lot of the organizations that we work with, uh, many of them on a very regular basis. Um, but because so many of our resources are behind the fence, we really do have to work a little extra hard about bringing those resources out to the public and so everyone can understand and really enjoy them. I think most people I encounter um, are very surprised that the Air Force or the Utah Guard or any of the military installations actually have an archeologist or an architectural historian um, working there and actually on hand um, and that there are those resources out there. So again, it, it's providing that education as well as letting them know that those resources aren't just being um, ignored, but they are being managed. Um, so Hill has been able to produce um, our own pamphlet. So if you kind of look at the bottom right, that is um, a pamphlet we created um, that is about our historic, the, the 63 miles of historic rail that used to be on Hill, some of which is still there. Um, and we were able to team up with both our Hill Aerospace Museum, but also Ogden Union Station and getting this out to folks. And so um, it used to be that it was always available at Ogden Union Station. I actually gave them the um, the, the, the pamphlet, the, the digital version of it, so they can print it anytime. Because it, it's not for us to say, oh, we just want to hand this out to certain people. We really want it to be made as available as possible. And so that's one way we've been able to do that. Um, and so as I mentioned earlier, we partnered with numerous agencies and organizations participating in events such as Indigenous Day, um, Archaeology Day, which is when we can get back to the face-to-face. -face. I'm hoping we have that happen again um, as part of Archaeology Month, like an event like this, being able to do these types of events. Um, these brown bag and virtual events has been a really great experience of COVID because it's found a, it's given us another way to still um, be able to bring in the, the resources out to people, but um, keeping us all safe at the same time. Um, and then we've worked with the Natural History Museum here in Utah on a couple of different um, things. So we have part participated in their behind the scenes 
um, event. We did that a few years ago on some of our key, um, key, key things that we found. And from that, we were able to, we were lucky enough to get some funding a few years ago to actually coordinate with them and partner with them on an exhibit that was originally supposed to be a temporary exhibit and has now become a permanent exhibit as part of um, the Natural History Museum and really highlights some of those um, old riverbed delta artifacts um, that we found. And that's kind of that center right photo is that exhibit that that is currently open. So if anybody um, has been installed and is ready to go. And so that's been a really great way that we've been able to bring resources out um, and share them. And so we've also worked with some amazing contractors who haven't just kind of stopped at doing the job, but been they, they've voluntarily taking on doing additional research and not just doing that research, but then sharing that research in different forums, such as conferences, um, articles, publications, all sorts of um, different ways. So that's helped get those resources out. And so um, at top left is one of those posters that was presented at, at um, conferences talking about the Hello site um, data recovery and what we found there. And so that's been amazing. And then one of my, our most exciting things is um, we were able to, we were lucky enough to be part of a um, PBS documentary, which was originally funded by the um, Nevada BLM and then produced by Cinnabar, Cinnabar Productions and Far Western and is available on PBS. So I think I had that link up there um, on the slides, but um, it is, if it, honestly, if you Google a point in time, PBS, it will bring that production up. And so we were able to be a part of that. And that was a really amazing experience on getting, again, a lot of this, this resource, these resources, this history um, out to the public and a wider audience for folks who, again, because, because we're so closed off, because there's so much security, you normally wouldn't be able to experience. Um, and again, I can't say enough that without these partnerships, we would not have so, ama so many amazing opportunities. Um, and so many chances to share our resources with the public. So a huge thank you to all of those folks because it is um, it, it is actually been a wonderful experience to work with um, through an installation that this this stuff was already I had this public outreach already set up and a lot of these things already in place and it's it's made it a really um, rewarding experience to be able to share our resources. So, Maya. All right. So, similar to Halo for Space and the other DoD installations, you know, our resources they're not they're on lands that aren't open to the public. They're restricted. Um, but there's many different venues that we at the Utah National Guard use to interact with the public. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one way to learn more about the Utah National Guard and military history is to visit the Fort Douglas Military Museum up at the University of Utah. Um, it's operated and managed by the National Guard and it's a great museum to you know, take a day trip um, and walk through. We have also recently produced a booklet which highlights Utah's water heritage um, and the different canals in the Utah Valley area. We will be distributing this soon to local schools and libraries. So if anyone out there is interested in receiving copies, please let me know and um, we can get those out there. But one of the biggest projects that we are working on right now, we're really excited about it, is we're currently working with SWCA. They are Environmental and Archaeology Contractor. Um, we are developing interpretive displays for one of the larger readiness centers at Camp Williams. You can see here on the screen a rendering of what the space looks like and what the displays will look like. So these displays will highlight everything from paleontology to Native American and pioneer history in the area. Um, but the majority of the displays will look at Utah National Guard history from the establishment of the Guard in Utah all the way to the National Guard today and what we're doing currently. Um, so we're covering a huge amount of time and we're hoping to have these really cool vibrant displays, lots of artifacts and uniforms on display um, to complement these visual displays that we're going to have. We are hoping to have these installed and ready for, ready for viewing um, in winter of 2021. That's our goal. 
And to complement these displays, we're also in the very beginning stages of developing a walking tour um, that will go around Camp Williams and highlight the historic structures and features. And then it will also include these displays in the readiness center. So we'll have, you know, kind of this comprehensive um, walking tour and interpretive displays to highlight the history of the guard and the history um, of the area before camp was there from paleontology through um, settlement and pioneers. So we're really excited about this. Um, one thing with Camp Williams is we aren't quite as restricted as Hill Air Force Base. So Camp Williams is open to the public if you have a valid ID um, and that is just the developed area. The training area is closed off to the public, but once these displays are finished, um, the public will be able to come and see them and learn about our National Guard history. So I think that is all we have. Um, I'll let Anya say something, but we have so much fun working for these DOD agencies. Their resources are so cool and so varied, and it really is, a pleasure to talk to you all today and share a little bit about what we do and the resources that we manage. Yeah, and I would say the same thing that um, I think we, we wanted to leave some time for questions. This was, this was kind of meant to be an overview, but we um, would love to be able to talk more, I think, about individual projects and things and stuff in the future, but we wanted to leave this time for questions and answers because, again, I know a lot of people aren't used to talking to the military archaeologists. <laughs> well, thank you two so much for that. Um, I learned things out of that too, even though I've worked with Anya and, and Mayan for many years on projects. So uh, please, uh, those of you that are in the audience, if you have some questions, start throwing them into the chat. If it's a longer one, feel free to unmute and ask. But um, I put one in there uh, just to prime the pump. So are there concerns with unexploded ordnance? And how do you handle those situations and concerns from both a, a practical level, but a, a cultural resource level? Um, so absolutely, that, that is a huge concern, um, especially out on the range. Um, and there, there, are, there are different approaches we take. We actually do have some areas that are literally strictly no-go areas, as we say, um, because the, the chance of encountering something that could be really um, not fun to encounter <laughs> um, is very high. And so those, those areas, we work closely with um, the SHIPA's office um, in just understanding that that's one of the restrictions we have. And so I think we handle it in different ways. We are very cautious. Some areas do have to be cleared or we have to be with um, an EOD crew ahead of time while we're out walking and surveying. Um, other locations, it's, it's things like the um, historic target study. That's one of the reasons we're really looking at doing that, not on the ground so much, but from the air, not just because the resources are often more visible and easy more, and easier to see at that point in time, but also just because some of them are dangerous enough. We don't want to put people in harm's way um, to, to try and find the stuff on the ground. So we're looking at really doing that aerial look at it and then going back and saying, are there places we do need to field check? Are we able to field check those? Um, how do we go on? For Hill, we also work very closely with some of our other groups who are out there on the ground. And so we've got our restoration crew that's out there often, our natural resource crew that's often out there doing stuff. And if they come across things, they let us know. And so sometimes we're able to grab that without having to, again, put somebody directly in the way just to do survey, but it helps us find those areas without necessarily hitting the, the more, the, the potential hazards. Um, and you'll find them out on archeological sites. We've got some um, great photos from one of the surveys where um, I think it was the one that was actually where we found that hello site that was excavated. We've got a great picture where we've got EOD taking care of modern munitions and we've got our archeologists there studying as we joke, prehistoric munitions um, within probably about 30 feet of each other. And so it, they're, they're just things we have training that has to happen before anybody goes out on the ground, they know what to look for. And it's harder for the archeologists because our environmental liaison um, 
who gets us out onto the ground that works for the UTTR specifically always jokes, well, if you didn't put it down, don't pick it up. That's not quite how archaeology works. <laughs> and so, um, no, it's really defining, helping, helping those crews that are going to be out there understand where, what things do you need to be watching for? What are the protocols if you do find something? And we've had to have um, times when the crews have had to step back, let EOD come in and take care of something um, before we can continue the survey. So it is definitely a concern and we have a lot of different protocols for different situations. But yeah, that's something we definitely keep an eye out for. <laughs> Yeah, it's very similar with Utah National Guard. I mean, we do have an area where we just, you just don't go because the history of, you know, um, fire and all these different weapons use, it's, you know, it's not just new. There's a long history in these areas. So there is that area we just don't go in and there is the possibility of finding unexploded ordinances in our other training areas, but you know, we go through trainings and if we spot something, we know what to do. If those do happen to be in an archeological site or some other resource, then we, we have pathways to make sure no one gets hurt and to try to do as much preservation as we can. And if we can't preserve the resource, then, you know, mitigation to make up for whatever impact happens from these unexploded ordinances. But that is something that we do have to worry about that you don't really think about if you work as an archeologist anywhere else. I know that was something new when I first came to this job. So <laughs> one other thing to look out for when you're staring at the ground looking for, for archeology span sites. <laughs> so probably not walk around and kick metal objects randomly. Probably not. No, thing to do. no, just leave them alone. <laughs> <laughs> the nice thing with archeology span is we generally tend to be looking at the ground already. So we don't usually yes. stumble on them, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. And I guess if, I guess you'll know your status, if your boss tells you to go to one of those areas that you know not to go, you know that you lowered your social scale. Yes. We um, messed up so somewhere. <laughs> one way trip. Um, so we do have another question from a person named Chris Hansen. Uh, he asks, in addition to unexploded ordnance, what are some of the more unique challenges in identifying and evaluating historic military buildings, archaeology, and landscapes compared to other federal agencies or land owners? Um, I think security is a big one. <laughs> um, yeah, of course, it's military, so there are a lot of things that do fall under different levels, like classified and such, and, and that goes to our um, things that are happening within some of the historic buildings um, specifically is one of the areas I can see that. And, and so it does make things trickier in that sense is we don't always have access to things. And in many cases, I don't necessarily want that access. I don't wanna know <laughs> what's going on. Um, and so that that can, I don't wanna say become a hindrance, but it, it can definitely, spur you to find unique approaches to being able to um, assess and manage those resources. Um, and then sometimes it's just getting access out to the area. Um, the Utah Test and Training Range is actively training on a regular basis and you can't always go to certain areas or if you can, you may only be able to be out there for part of the day and then you have to be pulled back to be able to go back um, at another time. And so it's just working around some of those, which is again, as Maya said, this is not something that I ever had experienced working in for other agencies. And so it's definitely a learning curve. Um, and the DOD, the military has their, they, and each agency within the military has their own language, I guess you could say. And so it's learning, learning that. So you're learning how to communicate why this, why our role is important, why protecting these and managing these resources is important and being able to communicate that to higher levels of leadership is another um, is another thing that that is different and new um, from working with different different agencies. So I would say those are kind of my big ones that I know I encounter kind of on a regular basis. Yeah, definitely coordinating. I mean, with training for the guard, we don't just have Utah National Guard. We have people from all over the country coming to train at Camp Williams. So it's a constant, you know, balancing act of okay, we can get out here this time or not this time, or, you know, they're doing sniper shooting today. You can't go anywhere today. Um, but I think with buildings, one of the main things is some of these structures just were not built to be around for a long time. 
you know, they were built for maybe five years and that was their, you know, supposed to be their lifespan, but here they are 50, 80 years later, and we're trying to keep them standing and keep them useful. So that's one thing. I mean, the officer's club that was built to last, that is, you know, the building that we have on camp that was, they put the most time and energy and effort into, but a lot of the other ones, like, I mean, like I said, my office, it's an old officer's latrine. That wasn't built to last probably. So we're having to put a lot of time and energy into creative ways to get these buildings to um, be useful and stay relevant and stay standing, I think. <laughs> now that's really interesting. We had one comment while you were talking, Maya, that at least it was the officer's latrine. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yes. None of these lower ranks here. <laughs> right, we have a couple more questions. So we have Heather Weymouth. Uh, Anya, is the target study also looking at the BLM lands north of Wendover? Um, yes and no. In, in detail, no, partly because um, it's not our land. And so me getting funding for that is not always the easiest thing to do. Um, but we are, as the history, looking at the historic context and um, the, the where the basically the range came from, we, we can't avoid looking at that and we wouldn't want to. And so, yeah, we're, we're definitely looking at it through the historic um, context part of this study, understanding what it is. We know our boundaries, our boundaries go on to, or those, this old historic landscape, target landscape goes on to Dugway Proving Ground, it goes on to BLM land. Um, when it was, when the Wendover kind of range was reduced, basically, it went to a variety of different organizations. So we're going to look at that as a whole and where it came from. But when we're looking at the archaeology specifically and what's still left on the ground, that is going to focus on um, those targets we know of within um, the range itself. Because again, this is, this is also a tool for management, for our um, leadership and stuff to understand how we can... Um, preserve and protect these resources as much as possible um, and understand where these resources are. And so we kind of have to be careful and when, when we expand a little bit out, outside of that, but we do understand that landscape does expand far outside of the current borders. Yeah, and, that, and thank you, Anya, for that. And it's also a good reminder that the World War II era testing isn't constrained to the boundaries of Hill and Dugway as today. So Bureau of Land Management Lands, which has open use, has unexploded ordnance, has targets, it has all sorts of additional material too. So don't go kicking things there either. Um, we have a, a we have a, another question from Fernita Maudsley. Um, she asks, I, I, I don't know if that's a she, I'll say Fernita asks, how do you get your funding? You mentioned grants, but does the funding on the basis include funding for these activities? So um, it's, it's going to be different for day, day each organization. <laughs> um, so for ours, if, if there are grants associated with, that's usually um, done through a partnership. So generally the partnership um, will we'll get a grant for that. Um, and then I have to go through one fun long process of saying why it's okay that we can accept um, that money. I have to get leadership approval to do that. Um, but most of our funding um, comes from a couple different sources. So when we're doing these projects like the ethnobotanical study and um, the historic target study, which fall under what um, is section 110 of the National Historic Preservation Act. So that's the one that is, I, I kind of put it, it's the proactive, what you're doing ahead of time versus section 106, which tends to be reactive. Um, so a project's gonna happen and then you do something. And so those projects that fall under that section 110 um, are ones that come from, um, we work with the Air Force Civil Engineer Center um, in, in getting that funding um, and having that come through. And so that, that's generally how that is funded. So it's kind of upper level Air Force. Now, any of those section 106 projects uh, Air Force wide tend to be funded by the proponents. So whoever is wanting to go do the work has to fund everything that comes from that work. And so that includes not just the cultural resource studies, but anything that falls under NEPA, um, restoration, any of that type of stuff would come from the proponent for the most part. So yeah, it, it can be tricky. And that's why funding can sometimes be tight because there's limited funding. 
um, for these type of projects. And there's a lot of installations out there. So we kind of all just put it, put it in, um, our name in the hat. Um, and we usually have some other funding sources that are sometimes available for emergencies um, and that type of thing. So we um, do have the second site I mentioned, the second fire pit site I mentioned is actually kind of going through that emergent funding kind of thing, that this is a problem. It's um, susceptible to erosion. It's in an area that the um, folks who manage the UTTR side of things would like to potentially do more work from. So there, there are some things that um, are putting it at risk basically. And so I was able to get some funding for that through, through um, that kind of more emergency emergent funding avenue. So, so those are the kind of different ways that we navigate. <laughs> Yeah, and the Utah National Guard is a little bit different. Um, so like I'm a state employee, but then with the military side, it's federal. So we kind of have a mix of, you know, state and federal funds and avenues and rules that we have to go through. But the National Guard does set aside funds that I can request every year. So like this year, we're doing about 3000 acres of resurvey at Camp Williams. Um, so I can ask funds for that, for evaluating historic buildings, reevaluating them. Um, money for travel consultation, really anything culture resource related, we can request funds for these projects that we wanna do in future years. So um, we kind of dabble in state and federal, but usually we have some good luck in getting funds to do new projects every year. Yeah, thank you too again. And we have another question from Evan Gabrielson. Uh, so this probably might be our last question for today, unless someone has something really burning, but uh, Evan asks, can you discuss what do you do when there's a conflict between cultural preservation and current military training needs? Um, I would say it starts with a lot of conversation. Um, <laughs> it, it really is. It's that there's a reason the Section 110 doing that proactive kind of stuff is really good because hopefully we can head a lot of these off because before it becomes too um, critical and they're not ready to build a new target site and right in the middle of an archeological site kind of idea. Um, but there are gonna be times that you can't, you cannot avoid um, archeological or in our case, I would say more often than not, it's actually our architectural resources that are often more at risk. Um, and so we, we have, it, it's one of those of a lot of discussion, a lot of conversation, what can we do to mitigate? What can we do to minimize? Which is usually our first one, what can we do to minimize? How can we have the least impact as possible on these areas? If we can't, how can we mitigate? What can we do? And um, there is the built-in process of doing a memorandum of agreement. If you do have what we call an adverse effect, um, that's, that's kind of our last thing that we wanna do, but in many cases, that's, that is the only path forward. Um, as Maya was saying, we have a lot of temporary buildings. Um, I think we have, goodness, 300 plus some buildings, um, historic buildings, eligible buildings on um, Hill and our um, different geographically separated units like the UT UTTR. And you just can't, you can't save them all. Um, they were built temporary. I, I, myself, I got dorms. So historic dorms that were only supposed to be there for about five years. I don't have to stay in the, I don't have to have my office in a latrine, but, um, <laughs> but the, this is the way of, of the military is a lot of these temporary buildings were constructed and then just continue on. Um, and so in that case, a lot of times we do have, there, there are going to be those adverse effects. And so if we're lucky, we have a recent project um, that happened just a few years ago where they are re-roofing our largest hangar. Um, which was in one of the first pictures of the slides, you saw the construction of it. It's the, the hangar itself is about 13 acres. And at the eighties, when they decided to repair the roof, they decided to put a steel roof on top of another steel roof and a building that's not made for um, seismic activity, shall we say, in an area that has seismic activity. And so it, it, there was no choice but to have to redo that entire roof. Um, the original roof also con contained asbestos in, in it. And so there are just a lot of issues. And so with that, when we were able to work with the proponents, the folks doing that, to actually bring back some of the original um, elements of the building, to actually bring it back to what it was when it was first built. So they're repainting the barrel vaults um, not the vaults themselves, but the sides of the barrel barrel vaults 
um, to the original paint scheme and they're replacing, they had taken, they it had skylights in, in those barrel vaults originally. And those were taken out or really just kind of closed over at one point in time. So we're putting those back in. And so if you're lucky, you can bring some of those elements in, but sometimes it just takes another mitigation effort entirely um, to kind of um, hopefully still be able to have that preserved in some way. And so the railroad pamphlet that um, I mentioned, our entire railroad is mitigated. For some reason, the soldiers don't like to drive um, you know, forklifts over bumpy railroads while carrying munitions. Um, and so a lot of our rail has had to be removed, but we were able to at least do a really thorough study of that railroad and put a pamphlet together and actually then get that out to the public. So it's more accessible than it ever was before it was mitigated. Yeah, and just really quick for the guard, I think we do a pretty good job of working with our project designers to avoid prehistoric archaeological sites, um, you know, kind of working around making sure that not impacted. But similar to Hill, a lot of our resources that do get impacted are the historic buildings. Um, that's the reason we are doing the um, interpretive displays at camp and the walking tour is to mitigate for demolishing these smaller buildings that were not meant to be around this long, they don't have a use anymore. Um, you know, they're not seismically reinforced. So they get torn down, but in exchange, we get these awesome interpretive displays and walking tour to really educate the public about these resources for a little building that nobody would see. And in exchange, we get these awesome things. So it's definitely a balance of preservation and, um, you know, allowing for the training that that needs to happen. Cool. Thank you two so much again. Before we give them a rousing round of virtual applause, I did want to make a soft pitch uh, now that we're wrapping up for today's brown bag. Uh, tomorrow evening at six o'clock, we are going to be hosting our uh, conclusion event really for Archaeology and Preservation Month's virtual world with a presentation by Joe Joseph. He's an archaeologist in Georgia. And he's going to be talking about uh, a, a threatened African, African burial ground in Georgia, but also efforts to create federal legislation to protect those places. Uh, and please, you know, if you're interested in the talk you heard today, come join us tomorrow night with Joe and, and hear that. We have one last big event that we're organizing for Archaeology and Preservation Month. If you're interested in going up to the Wasatch Back and, and Wasatch State Park, Elizabeth Hora is going to be throwing sticks at mammoths, at least cutouts of mammoths. So if you like kids to throw sharp objects, go up to Wasatch State Park on Saturday afternoon. Um, and so I want to personally thank Anya and Maya for your great presentation today. Thank you all for attending and the questions. So uh, golf clap for the Department of Defense representing today. Thank you guys so much.